John chapter 8. John chapter 8, starting in verse 12. Now that you have comfortably been seated for more than one minute, would you stand? (laughs) Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. Even if I testify about myself, Jesus replied, my testimony is true because I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. And if I do judge, my judgment is true, because it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Then they asked him, Where is your Father? You know neither me nor my Father, Jesus answered. If you knew me, you would also know my Father. He spoke these words by the treasury while teaching in the temple, but no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Then he said to them again, I'm going away. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he says where I'm going, you cannot come. You are from below, he told them. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Who are you? They questioned. Exactly what I've been telling you from the very beginning, Jesus told them. I have many things to say and to judge about you, but the one who sent me is true. And what I have heard from him, these things I tell the world. They did not know he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own. But just as the Father taught me, I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases Him. As He was saying these things, many believed in Him. You may be seated. This morning, we're going to be focusing on how Jesus identifies himself in verse 12. Jesus clearly says, I am the light of the world. This is on the heels of in chapter 7, Jesus says that he is the living water. One of several I am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. This autobiography that Jesus writes through these simple I am statements. I say simple in that they're just a few words, but... Simple doesn't mean, you know, easy to grasp all the time. Because the people to whom Jesus is saying these things, it is flying right over their heads. They have no idea what's going on. And just to rewind a little bit, that's because they are trying to hear Jesus with, with eyes and ears and hearts and souls that have not been made alive by the work of the Spirit. They are trying to absorb spiritual things without the capacity to do so. So it makes no sense to them. They are approaching Jesus with their own presuppositions, their own understanding of Scripture, their own understanding of traditions that they have superimposed over Scripture. They are hearing words, but they are not being moved by the truth. They're not being transformed through submitting to the truth. Jesus here says, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness but will have the light of life. If you look back in chapter 1 of John, you'll see where John says that in him was light, and the light was the life of men. This is John going back, and he is weaving in. Remember how I said we first started the Gospel of John months ago? That every chapter other than or after John chapter 1 was demonstrating that what John said in John chapter 1 was true, and this is another example. John uses Jesus' own words and says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And now in John chapter 8, we see Jesus saying that he is the light of life. John didn't make it up. He was simply repeating what he was already told. So let's talk about this light. Because we can talk all the time in the church about going and being light in a dark world. And that is a true... uh, 
symbolism. That is a, a true metaphor that Scripture tells us to do. But it's very important that we understand what light does in terms of Scripture. Because if we say, just go be light in a dark world, and that's it. There's no boundaries. There's no guardrails. There's no scriptural mooring to it. What happens? Well, then light becomes just another subjective word that you get to determine what light is, and you get to determine what light is, and you get to determine what light is. And lo and behold, it won't be very long before I decide that your light is actually darkness, and you decide that my light is actually darkness, because we're all making it up as we go along. Brothers and sisters, God has not left this up to our imagination. He's not left it up for us to try to figure out what light is. Because Jesus says he is the light. Notice he doesn't say he carries the light or he brings the light or represents the light. He says he is the light. So anything that we want to describe as light, it better match up with Jesus' teaching. It better line up with Scripture. That this is not up for negotiation. So in this passage, we see a few, we see three things about the light that Jesus actually does with his audience. And then a fourth that Jesus says elsewhere. The first thing is that the light illuminates truth. The light, Jesus illuminates truth. Notice in verse 12, he says, Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This light is not some metaphysical, nebulous, philosophical idea. It's not just a mindset. It is practical. It changes how we walk. The psalmist says that the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. That it ought to be informing our decisions. It ought to be helping us see the next step to take. It's practical, this light. And Jesus, in this passage, you can see him as they're asking questions. Where's your father? Where do you come from? What does Jesus do? This is one of the few times in the Gospels where Jesus answers their questions directly. Because a lot of times Jesus will ask a question and he skips right over it and gets to the person's heart. But Jesus, in John chapter 8, says... I'm going to answer you. You ask me a question, and I'm going to tell you the truth about it. Right here, right now, I'm not going to jump to any other topic. I am going to stay with you on this. By the way, that's not saying that Jesus did something wrong in those other instances, because how Jesus decides to answer a question is the right way to answer a question. Right? You may ask God a question, and you're like, and God gives you a different answer. You may be like, well, God, I didn't ask that question. Well, just trust for a second that maybe God knew the right question you should have asked. That Jesus, he testifies about himself and they, they argue. Well, your testimony is invalid because you're just talking about yourself. And Jesus says, even if I did testify about myself, my testimony is true. Because I am the light and I am exposing truth. I am illuminating to you what the reality is. My testimony is true in verse 14. Because I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know where I'm come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards, I judge no one. If I do judge, my judgment is true. Because it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the, I am the one who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Jesus here is, what is he doing? He's explaining to them. Listen, you may see me, and you may see just a guy bragging about himself. You may look at, they may have looked at Jesus and thought that he's a megalomaniac. That he's just a lunatic on some power trip. He's a delusional weirdo who thinks that he's the Christ. But Jesus says, I'm not what you think I am. You don't know where I'm from. You don't know who I am. Trust me, I'm telling you the truth. And then he even takes it a step further. He says, oh, by the way, even if you're not satisfied with me, just ex you accepting my testimony because I'm telling you the truth, understand this, that I'm not the only one testifying about myself. God the Father is on my side. God the Father is testifying to me as well. And this is what Jesus says throughout the Gospels. He says, if you won't believe my words, at least look at what I'm doing and believe me. Nicodemus, when he came to Jesus in John chapter 3, what did Nicodemus say? 
Teacher, we know that you are from God because no one can do the things you're doing if he weren't from God. It was the testimony from the Father about who Jesus really was. And Jesus walks them through this, these spiritual truths, but also these practical proofs that he should be listened to. He's illuminating the truth for them. He is pulling back the darkness of their answers. Then they turn to him and ask, where is your father? And Jesus says, you know neither me nor your father, nor my father. And if you knew me or my father, if you knew me, you would know my father. So let's just stop right there. That's a really significant statement Jesus just made. Jesus says, if you, the only way for you to actually believe in God is to believe in Jesus Christ. This is, an, this is a statement of exclusivity that Jesus just made. If you want to know God, you must know the Son. If you want to know the Father, you must know His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says it other ways elsewhere in the Gospel of John. But in John 14, 6, He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. In John chapter 10, He talks about uh, that, that he is the good shepherd, that he lays down his life, that he is the door. And he talks about thieves and robbers trying to get in other ways. And I love the picture of this in the great Puritan classic Pilgrim's Progress, where Christian is carrying this burden, and he's on this narrow path and with these tall hedges on each side. And in a moment, as he's walking down this path that there was only one entrance to, up over the side of these hedges come tumbling interlopers. And there's this dialogue of, well, you can't do that. I mean, that's not what John Bunyan wrote, but this is the summarized version of it, right? This is the cliff notes of the cliff notes. Christian says, that's not how you're supposed to get in here. And they say, who cares how we get in? We got in, didn't we? They didn't get in. That's when Jesus says that thieves come to steal, kill, and destroy, that they come to break in in the middle of the night and to take things that aren't theirs. Jesus says, if you want to be in a relationship with the Father, if you want to know the Father, the one and only true God, you must come to Him through Jesus Christ the Son. Jesus says, if you knew me, you would know my Father. But they don't accept Him. And by not accepting Him, they show that they've really actually rejected the words of the Father. The word that they're using to hang over everybody's head, it has turned from this redemptive and hopeful thing to this burden that they've laid on the backs of men and women that just crushes people. And Jesus says, that's not the purpose of the word that my father gave you. That wasn't the purpose of the law. If you knew me, you'd know him. But you don't know me, so you don't know him. See, this is, the, this is the thing that we have to let Jesus do. We have to let Jesus actually show us the way. We have to actually let Jesus be the light. Because what happens oftentimes, at least for me, is that I will go about my merry way. And I will look up and go, how did I get here? I was in Boy Scouts a long time ago. I didn't make it to the end of that particular journey, but I was, in, I was in Boy Scouts and they would teach you orienteering and that's the use of a compass. And I don't know, this might've just been the nineties. They took us out and just let us out of the back of a truck and said, we'll see you in the morning. <laughs> it was awesome. It was the greatest thing in the life of a 13 year old boy. Now I'm sure the adults were just kind of like on the periphery, making sure it didn't turn into the Lord of the Flies in a matter of minutes. But guess how many of us ingenious, know-it-all 13-year-olds actually made it to the final destination? Zero would be the correct answer. <laughs> None of us made it. Because what happened inevitably is we started out and we looked at the compass and we turned the dial and we're like, yep, this is the way to go. And we, because we had our compass in front of us and because we adjusted it and there's no way we could have been wrong, we followed it with confidence and eventually we looked up and thought, uh-oh. You ever been to that spiritual realization where you've been following something with confidence and you look up and go, oops. 
That's because in our spiritual life, sometimes we don't actually let, let Jesus light the way in front of us. Now, that doesn't mean that you're hopeless. It means that you're normal. And it means that you're still a work in progress. And it means that God is not done with you yet. And it means that God will demonstrate his faithfulness to you that when you look up and when you say, uh-oh, the light of the life will show, him, will show you the way back to where you're supposed to be. God's never going to be like, well, you got yourself in the mess. Find your way back. I'm not the one that moved. You're the one that went wandering off. That's not what Scripture tells us about Jesus. That's not what Scripture tells us about God. This is the God who chases after the one and leaving the 99 behind. This is the one who waits on the steps of his porch, longing for the return of the lost son and runs to meet him and welcomes him home. We have to let Jesus actually illuminate truth for us. We have to trust what he says, even when it's hard to hear. We have to let him be the one who speaks and us be the one who listens. We have to let him not just be the compass, but work the compass. Because I guarantee you, that band of 13-year-old know-it-alls, their compasses weren't broken. Their brains were. Right? Just pure arrogance. We thought we knew what we were doing, but it wasn't an instrument failure. It was a character issue. We must let Jesus be the light and pull open the truth about who we are, about who he is, about what he longs for us to be. And part of that is that we must understand that the light also exposes evil. The light exposes evil. Because that's what happens when you illuminate truth. When you shine a light into a dark room, shadows will be created. In this room right now, you can look around and you can see shadows on the walls, shadows underneath your pews. And let that be the metaphor. Is that where shadow exists, evil exists. The light has not yet touched that area. Jesus here in speaking with these people, he says hard things. For example, verse 21 then he said to them again, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. In verse 22, look at their arrogance. He won't kill himself, will he, since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. First off, they had already been, they've already been plotting to kill Jesus. And so for them to sit there and go, what? He's going to kill himself? They thought that that's the only place Jesus couldn't go or could go that they couldn't follow him is by him taking his own life. But it never occurred to them that he was speaking about their simple spiritual reality because he says, you will die in your sin. He illuminates truth for them that you are sinners and death will come for you. He repeats it again later on and they don't hear it. All they hear is, you can't go where we're going. They don't hear the truth that Jesus just showed them. And this is what evil does. Evil will not listen. It just won't listen. It won't listen to the truth. It won't let the light shine in. Verse 23, you are from below. He told them, I'm from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. This is Jesus illuminating truth and necessarily exposing the evil of their sins. And this is the evil of sin, is that it has infected us all. And not infected us as if we were unwilling participants it has infected us all, and it is demonstrated by the fact that we are all willing participants. Sin was not forced upon a single one of us. We, ran, we went running towards it. All of us. Every single one. That's why the Bible says that none of us are good, not even one. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But notice what Jesus says. Jesus, in exposing their evil, he says, you will die. There's still hope. Because light is anchored in hope. That's important, church. Because it's very easy for us to get stuck on exposing evil. It's very easy for us to get stuck on talking about what goes on in the shadowy 
recesses of our culture and the hearts of our neighbors. It's very easy for us to look at the world around us and offer a lament of, look, this place is going to Hades in a handbasket. It's very easy for us to do that, but that's not what Jesus does. That's not where Jesus stops. Is it true that if they do not believe in him, they will die in their sins? Absolutely, it's true. And that ought to be proclaimed. But notice, Jesus doesn't just say, you are going to die in your sins. He says, if you don't believe that I am he. That statement matters just as much as the statement, the declaration that they'll die in their sin because there is hope, there is a rescue, there is redemption available by simply believing in the light of the world, simply embracing the living water that Jesus offers in himself. That there is hope. That yes, the world is evil. It's broken. It has no choice but to be. And the only cure for it, the only hope for it, is the good news of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. And notice, Jesus here is not even attacking the culture. Jesus is speaking to people. He's not saying the culture will die and go to hell. He's looking at the individual and he's saying, you, if you don't believe, will die in your sin. Hell is personal. God's judgment is personal. And Jesus here is speaking to people and he, and he pulls back the curtain and he simply shows them, you are not from the same place I am. You are from below. I'm not. You are of this world. I am not. I'm different than you. And that's why you need me. I've come to pull you out of the darkness that you think is light. By the way, that's what Scripture says. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Our world, drenched in sin, is upside down in its definitions. We hold up as values the things that God condemns as abominations. We hold up as nobility the things that God has said that is reprehensible to Him. And I'm not just talking about like the big sins that we like to talk about. This week I was reading, uh, Jeremiah and I were sitting down having a conversation uh, every night and about, about Scripture. I say every night. That doesn't happen every night. Let's be real, okay? I would love for it to happen every night, but there are some nights where he's tired or sick, and I'm sick and tired. I don't know. (laughs) So one of the nights this week where we were sitting down talking, his devotional had him read through Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, I think, which is where we, that's the verse we talk about, you know, improper same-sex relationships and those kinds of things. And that's usually where we stop. But if you actually read Romans chapter 1, that's just where it starts. And then it says that God removed the hand of restraint from them. He turned them over to a depraved mind. And then he lists a whole bunch of other things they did after he turned them over to depraved minds. Did you know in that list there's things like gossip? Did you know according to the holy God, gossip and improper physical relationships, I'm saying that very carefully because it's family worship day, okay? All right. It's not like I'm soft shoeing it just to soft shoe it. There are little ears, okay? God says gossip and that big relational sin are the same in his eyes. And then after that, what gets worse, teenagers and kids, it says disobedient to parents. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Your dad is, I'll call your dad and see how that plays out, right? (laughs) That the Bible, that we should not be using Scripture just to point out all the evil things that people did. We should say, yes, evil has pervaded our hearts and minds and souls. It's not just this exterior thing that the culture foists upon us. It is oozing out of you apart from Christ. That's why it is present in the culture. It's because it is, the, it is the, the culmination of the individuals coming together and saying, this is what we want to praise. That's what the culture is. It exists in the culture because it exists in us. 
not the other way around. And Jesus says, it is evil. You are not from the same place I am. We are not on the same team. But there's hope. That all you need is faith. All you need to do is believe that I am He. You don't have to get your life right. You don't have to abandon all of those things under your own power. You don't have to align yourself with the right socio uh, culture, cultural narrative. You must believe. There's hope. There's hope in this. Verses 27, he says, they, do not, they did not know he was speaking out the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. And that I do nothing on my own, but just as the Father taught me, I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. That is a message of hope, believer. Listen to that. Jesus says, when you lift me up, what does that mean? When you hang me on a cross to die. Jesus says, when you put me through the most torturous thing anybody can ever go through, my Father's with me. My Father's with me. And by the way, that's the same thing Jesus says to the disciples in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. He says, Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Believe in no matter what you're facing, no matter what evil you find yourself indulging in or in the midst of the people around you, there's hope because God is with you. The light of the world is with you. And that's the last thing this morning, is that this light, Jesus has been given to us. In the next chapter over, John chapter 9, you see in verse 5, where Jesus says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Is Jesus still in the world? Not physically. Not ph physically, He resurrected and ascended into heaven and will return someday. But the Spirit of Christ absolutely is still present in the world. And that's in you, believer. That's in us as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. So we should shine like a city sitting on a hill. One of my, whenever our kids were smaller, uh, we were out Christmas tree, or not Christmas tree lighting, Christmas light seeing. What, are we, what am I saying? We were looking at Christmas lights. Thank you, Irma. We were looking at Christmas lights. And we were up in the north of Denton. Is, we kind of live south of Denton, so we were out driving around. And up near Lake Ray Roberts, there is a house that is owned by Randy Travis, the country star. And as you would imagine, it is not a small domicile. It is, it is quite large like 35,000 square feet or something crazy. And they had that thing decked out with just simple white lights, which are my wife's favorite. She likes just the clear white light or the clear lights. Simplicity. But we were probably five miles away from that house whenever the kids spotted it. And you could have heard them go, you heard them all go, ooh. <laughs> That's Thank you, McKenna, for the documentary-style reporting there. I appreciate it. And they could say that from five miles away because Randy Travis's house is up on a hill. Lit. Lit up in the darkness. It is the only thing in the night sky. And it was at that moment when I hear my kids from the back seat go... Thank you. We did not plan this. This is on the fly. It's working great. Whenever I hear them do that, it hits me. That's exactly what Jesus tells us to be. Not just a showy spectacle, but simple, clear testimonies that we have been changed by this light. That we have been given not just something bright and shiny, but we've been giving something substantive, the light of life. 
that our life has been changed, that our life has begun in Christ, and it will find its end in Christ. And when we find our end in Christ, we will be awakened into an eternity with Christ. This is what the light of life does for us. It's been given to us, and here's the important reminder, is that it is not your light. It's been given to you, but you're not the author of it. You're not You're not the genesis of this light. You don't have to generate your own light, believer. You don't. You are carrying it. In a few months, this summer is the is the Summer Olympics in Paris. And in April, the the uh, the relay of the Olympic torch will begin. It will fly from Greece to France, and then that torch will travel all over the regions of France before it makes its way to the Olympic Games to light the cauldron. What a wonderful symbol of that torch is going to be carried by hundreds of different people all over the country. And while they are carriers, they are torchbearers, none of them started that torch. It doesn't belong to them. And they are just handing it off to the next person and to the next person to the next person. But guess what? That torch isn't the source of light because that torch has its genesis somewhere else. The Olympic torch is started in the ruins of Olympia in Greece, using the rays of the sun to start a fire. That Olympic torch, as glorious as it is and as big of a fire as it will turn into in the Olympic cauldron, it is not its own source. It gets its source from somewhere else, the sun. Believer, you and I are torchbearers. The gospel is the torch, and we get it from the sun. We get it from Jesus. It's all Him working in us and through us, emboldening us for this mission. Letting Him be the light. Letting Him expose the evil. Letting Him offer hope to those walking in darkness. And reminding us that we are to go do one job. To be a city on a hill. To offer hope in the midst of hopelessness. To offer glory in the midst of despair. To offer people truth that God has spoken with His own mouth in an age of lies and conspiracies and man-made doctrines that are leading people to dance merrily through the gates of hell. Jesus is the light of life and that light is the life of men. And it's been given to us to go reflect that light to our neighbors to our families, to complete strangers, and to people all around the world. Praise be to God that He has called us to such a monumental task. Praise be to God that He gives us everything we need to do that task. Our prayer this morning is that, one, if you've never known life in Jesus Christ, that you would turn to Him today. Jesus says it as simply as could be said in John chapter 8. Believe in Him and be rescued from your sin. If you haven't trusted in Christ, now's the time. May today be the day of your salvation. There's no magical prayer. There's no repeat after me. There's no fill in the blank. It is you crying out to God, admitting that you're a sinner, and crying out to God for forgiveness of that sin through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's you believing and God forgiving and making you new. But many of you are already believers, so what's, what do we do? We let the truth of God's word shine into our lives. We immerse ourselves in this light. We let it expose evil inside of us. We submit ourselves to the purifying work of the Holy Spirit and we do our best under God's power to reflect the light of Jesus Christ to the world around us. And he will honor it. Maybe not for your glory. Maybe you will die and be forgotten within a generation. But the name of Jesus Christ, the only name that matters will go on through your faithful reflecting of the light of life that is Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, may we step into the light this morning. May those who do not yet know Jesus Christ, may today be the day where they turn from their sin, turn from themselves, and turn to you the light, the living water, the only way to a relationship with God. 
May they cry out to you now in these moments. And in a few moments, may they have the boldness to tell someone that they've trusted in Christ so that we may celebrate with them. Maybe they need to follow through with baptism. They've trusted in Christ, but they've never taken that simple, important step of obedience. God, may they step forward and say, I need to obey God this morning. Father, for all of us, would you show us what our next step of obedience is? None of us are perfect. None of us have it all figured out. We are all still works in progress. So Father, shine your light into our hearts and minds and help us to see how we could submit to you and honor you with our lives that we might be more ready to speak and live the truth of Jesus Christ in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.